I'll be reading from the New American Standard, um, Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, if you'd like to follow along. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob, and I, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning. Uh, we had a, a, a member ask if, if I would talk about uh, election, um, and so we're going to talk about how people typically use the word election, uh, and then how that election really seems to work according to uh, what the Bible uh, says. Um, I, I'll also say we've got quite a bit to do, so get your fingers ready. Um, this might be one of those mornings where a digital Bible might serve you a little bit better, because um, you might be able to turn uh, a little bit faster. But we're going to talk about what is election, and then more importantly, are we of the elect, uh, the elected ones? So there's uh, the outline of how this lesson is going to work. There are four main sections this morning. First of all, we're going to explain what the acronym TULIP is, if you've never heard of that before, uh, because that's going to be important to understanding where we go from here in understanding election. Um, and TULIP is the idea of, uh, of Calvinism, so we're going to look at the Calvinistic explanation of election and predestination. Uh, those two go hand in hand with one another. Essentially, they are the same thing, but we'll get to that. And then we're going to answer the question, does God always get his way? And that's going to be important later as well. And then finally, a look at true biblical election. All right, so let's look here uh, first at TULIP. If you've never heard of TULIP before, uh, this is an acronym that is used to teach Calvinism. Um, Calvinists came up with it. This was not my idea. This is their idea. Um, and the letters here, I'll say TULIP is better than DIGP. So TULIP is better, we'll, we'll see. Um, but... Uh, this is a much better acronym, but it stands for the T is total depravity. Um, and true scholars of Calvinism will say that uh, inherited sin and total depravity are different, but most people who understand and believe in Calvinism will say uh, they're pretty much the same thing. And so this idea of total depravity is the idea that we inherited our sin from Adam and this is the really important part. We can play no part in our salvation. That's very important to understand here. Okay? There is not a single thing we can do that brings us closer to God. Okay? The U in TULIP stands for unconditional election. And this idea is also of predestination. Okay? Um, God has chosen who the elect are. These are the ones who are saved. I threw in a word here, arbitrarily, um, because again, if, if there's absolutely nothing I can do, it's no part of myself, then the choice has nothing to do with humanity as a, as a whole. So the ones that are chosen to be the elect have to be arbitrarily chosen. That, that's how this works, Okay. So God arbitrarily chose those who would be saved. And if you're not of the saved, you're not one of the chosen, then sorry. Okay? God only selected a few people. Even though there's nothing that I can do, God made the choice. Okay? And this predestination is the idea that the elect were chosen before time. Which that was true. The elect were chosen before time, but we'll get there. All right. So God has chosen who the elect are. 
The L is for limited atonement, and that means that forgiveness is only for the elect. And the, the bigger point behind this, and you'll hear people like uh, John MacArthur, who is the, uh, the foremost uh, Calvinist evangelist, um, will say that Jesus did not die for anyone else but the elect. Okay, so that's, uh, Jesus didn't die for the whole world, he only died for the elect. Now, this next part, the I, is going to be the, the most important part to understand along with election. Okay, it's the two things that we're going to be covering today, primarily. And the I stands for irresistible grace. And that means that grace, or the presence of God, is impossible to resist. Okay, so when God decides that he has chosen you, you are one of the elect, you have no choice but to accept the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then lastly, the P stands for perseverance of the saints, and that's once you've become a member of the elect, the Holy Spirit will prevent you from sinning. Okay, so these five things really sum up all of Calvinism in a nutshell. And even though he himself didn't use tulip, uh, John Calvin, who the name Calvinism comes from, uh, one of the members of the Reformation along with Martin Luther, uh, and in fact the anniversary of Martin Luther posting his 95 Theses to the door is October 31st, so it's right around the corner here. Um, but this is what he taught, he just didn't use the acronym tulip, um, but this is what he taught. And so we're going to focus here. The point of it is we're going to look at this idea of election. But the most important part about the election really comes down here with irresistible grace. So those are going to be the two things that we focus on the most today. Um, and again, there I, I preach a, about 88 sermons in the year. I could probably do a whole year just going through all of this. Um, but sur surely we don't have enough time for that. So let's first look at the idea of election. We're going to talk about where those words are used, how it's often uh, attributed in Calvinistic teaching. Again, I just want to, I want to point out, I usually try to give this caveat. When I'm talking about any sort of uh, ism or a, a group of, uh, of people who have the moniker of Christian, um, it's not my goal up here to simply uh, bash or throw under the bus. It's really to understand what is being taught and then just to simply turn and what is the Bible teaching. That's all I'm trying to do here. Um, so I want to make that very clear, uh, especially for people who, who are here among us who actually believe this. My, my goal here is not to bash your beliefs. It's to examine carefully what God has to say. That's all we're trying to do here. So let's look here at the idea of election. So the words election and predestination. Um, the, the word election uh, is ekloge, okay? And it appears in uh, a few places in uh, the New Testament. Uh, the first is Acts chapter 19. We're not going to turn there. We're actually going to turn to Romans chapter 9, if you'll turn there first. But um, Acts chapter 9 and verse 15 is where uh, God is telling Ananias, I have chosen Paul. Okay, it's this idea that I have elected him. In the New American Standard, the word is not elected. The word is chosen is how the word is translated. So you'll see that a bit as I read through some of these verses. Uh, Romans chapter 9 uh, Chapters 8, 9, and 11 are particularly important to uh, understanding Calvinistic teaching. So um, we're going to look there here very quickly. Um, and in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, Paul is talking to the Thessalonian church that they are the chosen of God or the elected of God. And then 2 Peter 1 verse 10, which in our Bible class we are studying that context, and there Peter says, uh, make sure uh, of your calling and election, or make certain of God's choosing of you. Okay, so it's a very interesting 
phrase, uh, especially as we get further and further into our lesson. Um, the idea of predestination comes from the word predestined, um, which is the Greek word praorizo, praorizo, and we see uh, that here, Acts chapter 4, verse 28, is where uh, those who are being saved are the chosen of God. We'll read Romans 8 here very soon. Uh, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, and then two times in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. Um, so while you are in Romans chapter 8, 9, and eventually 11, which, yes, we skip over chapter 10. Chapter 10 will come up later in the lesson because chapter 10 is vitally important about understanding 8, 9, and 11, um, and it often gets left out. So we'll look at that here in just a moment. While you are in Romans, I'm going to turn to John chapter 15. Uh, this is another important verse that... Uh, people will go to to talk about predestination and election. This is Jesus talking. In John chapter 15, verse 12, he says, This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you that you love one another. It's a very important uh, idea there. Now, it's not the same word as election here, this word choose that I just read. Not the same word, um, but uh, I don't want to get too deep into the context here in John chapter 15. But the idea there is uh, Jesus saying, you didn't all as my apostles search me out. I went and I selected each one of you. That's what he's talking about. Um, however, this verse is often used to talk about predestination and election, that God had chosen the apostles long before the beginning of the world. But let's look here at a few verses in Romans chapter 8. Um, we're going to start in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Keep that. Underline it, highlight it, star it. I don't care. Mark it. Keep that not just for your own records of going through your Bible, but also for later in the lesson, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay? So, notice how this all comes together. God foreknew, okay, and through that foreknowledge, right, so he knew each person he would elect. This is, this is their thinking. Follow with me. Everyone who he foreknew before the beginning of time, he predestined. So it's not their destiny. It is before their destiny would even be written that they would be conformed to Jesus. Okay, that's the idea here. Then if you turn over into chapter 9, okay, so here... Paul is talking about Israel, okay? Uh, and in, in fact, if you're confused about that, he mentions them in verse 4. He says, Who are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh. So he's focused on Israel right now. And then he says in, uh, in verse 8 of Romans chapter 9, uh, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will, shall have a son. But not only this, there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for through the twins were not, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand. 
not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so they'll say, it doesn't matter who they were, God had made the choice. The problem is, what kind of life did Jacob and Esau live? That election is a very interesting point then. They, Jacob did not live the beginning of his life in a godly way at all. It's really not until God changes his name to Israel, uh, contending with God, wrestling with God, that's when he finally starts living rightly. Um, but if you keep going, verse 16, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs but on God who has mercy. Okay, then he's going to bring up Pharaoh. That's a very important uh, point that many people will make. Search up the word hardened, either in the New American Standard or in the New King James, and look at all those verses, and I'll tell you, you you'll find it very interesting and very telling um, what we see about this idea of hardening hearts and how it pertains to Pharaoh and God. Very interesting. Please do that on your own time. Um, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, verse 18, and he hardens whom he desires. Um, and, and so this idea that God exercises his sovereignty over us comes here with verse 21. Does the potter not have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Um, <clears throat> And then verse 23, he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand, that's the predestination, for glory, even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Okay, and then if we get over into chapter 11, okay, hopefully you're following along with the, the, the logic that's being used here. Okay, if we start around verse 5, um, you know, we'll, we'll, start, uh, we'll start a little bit earlier. Let's start in verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Uh, and then if we keep going... Again, it's, you have to sort of pick out the verses here instead of reading it as one continuous uh, idea. Um, verse 17 is now an important verse to start in. If some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partakers of them, of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are arrogant, remember, it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off so I might be grafted in quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you will stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. Behold then, verse 22, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Okay, so what's happening here is there is a combining of all of these passages to show that God, before time, decided who these elect are going to be, and it has nothing to do with what we do. It's 100% what God has to do. And I think you've, you see that in the verses that, we have, <clears throat> that we've picked out here. If you want to look at some of these other uh, verses here, you're going to find Paul or other writers like Peter saying very similar things. Of course, I'll tell you the context is rather important. But um, if you just look at each verse in its own uh, uh, in an isolated fashion that's called exegetical uh, reading, 
uh, then you're going to see a lot of what we're talking about right now. Um, however, I, I want to go back to this idea of, because um, we're going to move on to the question of, does God always get his way? Because this goes back to the idea of the elect and of irresistible grace. Um, I mentioned John MacArthur earlier. Uh, I, I would say the uh, foremost perhaps of all of time so far, besides John Calvin himself, um, is the, the foremost preacher of Calvinism. And I was listening to one of his uh, sermons a few years ago, um, and he, had, he was talking about Jesus dying only for the elect and who the elect really are. And then he comes to talk about irresistible grace, and he says, those so-called Christians who are non-Calvinist, which he calls non-believers, that's what he means, is non-Calvinist, um, then they do not understand that God always gets what he wants. You will hear them say, God does not always get what he wants, but I avow, God always gets what he wants. Anybody want to prove that to me? Because the problem is, the Bible is filled with examples that say that is a lie. And this is what I call the hen. This comes from Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. The sister passage to this is Luke chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. That sounds like God is calling, and people were saying, no, thank you. And this is then a problem that we see all throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 12. I will destine you for the sword, and all of you will bow down to the slaughter, because I called and you did not answer. I spoke and you did not hear. You did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. By the way, who are these people? God's chosen people. I'm just going to point that out there. Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, because you have done these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. Then he says, I'll bring calamity on you. Jeremiah 17, verse 27, if you do not listen to me, what, if, if you do not listen to me, I'm not supposed to have a choice here, to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying a load and coming in through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and I will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and not be quenched. Okay. Haggai chapter 2, verse 17. I smote you and every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. This is God constantly calling. And he's not just calling anybody. He's calling his people and they're not answering. It sounds like a group of people who were pushing against God's call, which is not possible. Unless it is, and we're wrong. Which it seems that that's the case. There's another idea that goes along with the hen problem, and it's just the fact that the Bible is filled with warnings. And in fact, I would point out to me one of the biggest proponents against the idea of unconditional election and irresistible grace is the fact that this exists at all. Because this doesn't need to exist if God is going to force truth and righteousness upon me. This does not need to exist. And on top of that, this is filled with warnings. If God will prevent me from sinning, why do I have to be warned? 
Let's look at some of these warnings. First, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, here the people are standing on two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is supposed to be the, the mountain of blessings. Okay, and so the people that are on Mount Gerizim are calling out all the blessings that God is going to bring on the people. And those standing on Mount Ebal are pronouncing all of the curses that God will bring on the people if they don't follow the covenant of God. So all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you, which he forces you to command. So if you're not doing it, he didn't command you to do it. And so he's punishing you because he didn't make you do it. Are we following? I think we're following. Again, I, I'm going to hearken back. I'm not just trying to bash and be ridiculous. I want you to see that this is not biblical. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, thirst, nakedness, and the lack of all things. And he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Chapter 30 and in verse 17, if you're, if, it's a funny two-letter word, if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today, you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter it and possess it. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 15, if, you're going you're gonna to hear that word a lot. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, that's his calling, by the way, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Jeremiah 22, we're going to start in verse 1. Go down to the house of the king of Judah and there speak this word. Say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, who sits on David's throne, not his David's throne, you and your servants and you people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Also do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. So clearly he's expecting them to do this. Okay. For if you men will indeed perform this thing, then kings will enter the gates of this house, sitting in David's place on his throne, riding in chariots and on horses, even the king himself and his servants and his people. But if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house will become a desolation. For thus says the Lord concerning the house of the king of Judah, you are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, yet most assuredly I will make you like a wilderness, like cities which are not inhabited, for I will set apart destroyers against you, each with his weapons, and they will cut down your choicest cedars and throw them in the fire. Many nations will pass by this city, and they will say to one another, Why has the Lord done thus to this great city? It's an interesting question. Then they will answer, Because they forsook the covenant of the Lord their God, and bowed down to other gods and served them. This is God's chosen people forsaking the covenant of God. Romans chapter 11 and in verse 25, notice here what he tells the Romans. We were just reading in Romans 11 earlier, weren't we? For I do not want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, hold on. He's going to be talking about something else, but there's an interesting problem here. He's talking to the church at Rome, who he calls saints, which means they are of the saved, they are of the elect, of the elect and he warns them not to be wise in their own estimation. What is the point of giving the warning? They can't do it. It's impossible for them. 
Why give the warning? Galatians chapter 4. However, at that time, verse 8, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, that means you're what? Of the elect, right? You have come to know God, or better, God has come to know you, okay? How is it you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? What? That's not supposed to be possible. You observe days and months, seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I beg of you, brethren. He's part of the elect, right? Because he's an apostle. So he's calling them brethren, but they have turned away from God. Become as I am. Okay. Not be who the Holy Spirit's going to make you be. For I also have become as you are. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 12. Take care, brethren, there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. He told them, take care. Take care that this doesn't happen? An unbelieving heart that falls away... From the living God. Again, not supposed to be possible. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So before God hardens your heart, apparently. That's the way this works. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Notice he didn't say, today if you hear his voice, you will not harden your hearts. It's a command. Don't. Do not do this. Not you will be unable. And then chapter 12, verse 3, same book. Consider him, that's Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know what he didn't say? Don't worry, you won't grow weary or lose heart. That's not what he said. He says, be careful that you don't. 1 John chapter 2. If you have an anointing from the Holy One, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, wait, he said earlier, you have an anointing from the Holy One. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. The last verse we're going to look at here about warnings is Revelation chapter 3. Verses 14 through 18 here, he is talking to the church of Laodicea, okay? And he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this. That's Jesus. Jesus says this. I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Who is he talking to? A church. The Holy Spirit calls it a church. 
And these are people whom Christ is addressing directly. And they're no longer acting like a church. I would also like to point out, um, we're not going to turn here, but I want to go back in our minds to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, is a, uh, a parabolistic view of the day of judgment. It says that those who are on the right are the ones who go to life, and the ones that are on the left are the ones that go to judgment. And it's interesting what Jesus says they're going to be judged by. And they're going to be judged by what they have done. Which, if, if we're judged by what we do, but we can only do what the Holy Spirit makes us do, then those who didn't, they didn't have any help from God. God didn't help them. So God says, you know what? I decided not to help you, and I'm going to punish you for that. Is that really the righteous God that's described in our Bibles? What really is the elect then? Who are we? And I say we. I say we very particularly. I think we're going to find what the New Testament says about us then. Because remember our question, what is it and do I have it? So let's talk about this. If the rest of the Bible is able to prove that what we read... In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 9, and Romans chapter 11 is not quite the way that it's been portrayed, then that means we have to look at those verses differently. Because God isn't going to say one thing and then contradict himself in the very next chapter or in another book. That's not who God is. He is not contradictory. So if I say, well, Romans chapter 8, 9, and 11 are saying this, and there's other places in the Bible that say, nope, that's not right, which I think we've proven. We've had a lot of scriptures up here already. Then that means I have to go back and look at them differently so that it all meshes. So, instead of the elect being an arbitrarily chosen group of people, what if the elect are those who have aligned themselves to a particular character? And I don't mean character as in a person, which is true. It's Jesus. We're going to talk about that. But it's about the character. God predestined, God elected, that a certain kind of person would find salvation. However, that kind of person is not someone who we can naturally be in its entirety. We still need Christ and the Father to explain to us how to live according to that character. There will be some parts of ourselves that might already lend itself to that character. However, we need to mold ourselves, especially the pieces that don't fit already, and that's going to be every single one of us, we have to mold ourselves to the character that God is looking for. And we only know that because of what God has given us. See, it's still the grace of God at work. It is not of myself. Because God's saying, look, you have to be this kind of person, and you can only be that kind of person with my help. But he expects us, now that he's come 99% of the way, he said, all I'm asking is for you to come 1%. Is that fair? And let me tell you, I think that's fair. I think that that's more than fair. In fact, it's very unfair. It's very unfair to what Jesus had to go through for me. But I'm not going to question the Lord about it. So what kind of character is God expecting out of the elect? Matthew chapter 6 Verses 14 and 15, if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you will not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. 
So, one, so a member of the elect has to be a forgiving person. Notice here, Jesus is commanding this. It's not given as an imperative statement, but he's saying this is true. If you're not going to do this, good luck to you. You're not going to find forgiveness with the Father. Matthew chapter 18. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice here, truly I say to you, you will not come to the kingdom of heaven unless the Holy Spirit makes you? No. You have to become like children. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives such a one in my name receives me. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. In case you didn't think God was serious. So notice here that there are qualities that children have naturally that we're born with that lend themselves to a proper godly character. Here, Jesus points out humility. Trust is another good one. Children are very trusting. Obedient, although that one, you do have to have some instruction. But obedient children. These are the kinds of people that we ought to be. We are not children. We share the characteristics that children have. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 15. What does it say? So remember, we read 8, 9, and 11. Now we're going to scoot right in the middle of that and see if Romans 10 helps us understand 8, 9, and 11. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not whoever is called on, whoever calls on. But we don't stop there. Verse 14. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? Well, that's all the Holy Spirit, right? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without the Holy Spirit? No, without a preacher. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Not how beautiful is the Holy Spirit who forces salvation upon you. Are we getting it yet? I hope we're getting it. A couple more passages here. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Notice here, walk by the Spirit, that's a command. That's an imperative statement. You walk, not you will walk by the Spirit. No, walk by the Spirit. That is a command. Hebrews chapter 6. This is our last passage we're going to turn to, but we have three more passages we're going to talk about briefly. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and, is, and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope 
until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Did you catch verse 11? We desire that each one of you show the same diligence. It's not a desire if it's going to happen automatically. I don't have to desire it. I can say, I'm so glad that it's going to be this way. Not, I desire it. There's three more things that we need to talk about here that come along with this idea of the character of a person. Look at what Jesus told us. He listed, blessed are they who blank. These are the Beatitudes, is what we call them. They're the roadmap to being a citizen of the kingdom. Or Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And giving the fruit of the Spirit off of the tree of your Christian life. Or, as we call the Christian graces, that's what we're studying in our Bible class. Um, both the adults and the high schoolers are studying the Christian graces, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And this is the, if you're unfamiliar with the term, the Christian graces, it's where uh, Peter says, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, and so on. And so these are, when, when Christ asks us to be this, it's not, oh, by the way, this is who I'm going to make you be. He says, this is who you should strive to be. And if you strive to be this, then you will be of the elect. The people that live like this are the ones who were predestined to eternal life. They're the ones who have been elected. It's not an arbitrary choice. It is those whom God says, if you will live like this, then you will have life eternal. Do you have it? Now, I can't answer that question for you. You have to answer that question for yourself. I'm going to tell you right now. If you haven't heard the word of God, believed what you have heard, repented of your life of sin, confessed in the name and salvation of Jesus Christ, have been baptized in water, and then lived your life like that last slide here, if you haven't lived like this, then no, you are not one of the elect. But you can be. See, that's the other thing about Calvinism. If you're not one of the elect, you never will be. Because God has already chosen. But a true God of righteousness, as he has told us, is going to give you a chance. He's going to give you a chance to be one of the predestined elect. But you have to come that 1%. He's not asking you to be crucified, crown of thorns, 40 lashes. He's not asking for any of that. But what he's asking for is something that he cares much more about than a crucifixion, which is your life dedicated to his son. If you will dedicate your life to his son this morning, please take advantage of this opportunity and come up here as we stand and as we sing.